subway, mass transit ticket. Welcome, Mr. Bolivar. Good afternoon, my name is Carl Weaver. <coughs> I'm usually very controversial uh, and never politically correct. So the hell with that, you'll have to deal with it. Um, so I'm going to give you a presentation about Wearable payment smartwatches with eSIM and NFC for subway transit ticketing. Now, uh, I have been told by my current employer, so I was working for a company called Simility Labs, small UK, UK Irish startup, um, and we were bought by Arm about three months ago. And so now I work for Arm, I'm an Arm employer, I work in the Bellevue, Washington State office of Arm. Everybody welcome to Seattle, hey, latte land. So, my presentation will be about smartwatches, and in the architecture of my right wrist, I'm not supposed to name names, I have a smartwatch. This is a very cool smartwatch, but I, I can't name names. Uh, this smartwatch can be bought in China, and you can um, add the subway transit ticketing uh, applications for Beijing, Shang Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou right on the watch to do payment right in the subway. That is cool. You do not see that too many places in the world right now. So that is very, very cool. Of course you can do it with a smartphone as well. So who am I, what do I do? Uh, I'm a Greater China and India and Asia wireless market mobile device specialist. I'm ex Gemalto. I worked five years in China, Gemalto, and to enable near-field communications, NFC, to all the Android-based smartphones on the planet. Uh, and I'm also involved in the TEE, the Trusted Execution Environment, Embedded Mobile Device Security, um, and, uh, and now I become, I come full circle, and now I'm an, I'm an ARM employee. I've, uh, my Mandarin was studied in Taiwan. I have been uh, involved in the Chinese world for over 30 years. I speak, read, and write Mandarin Chinese. Um, I would like to discuss basically my humble opinion that smartwatches are IoT devices. And tonight, this afternoon I'm going to talk about three key things. I'm going to talk about embedded SIM, which is low-hanging fruit for smartwatches tablets, notebooks, and eventually smartphones. I'm going to talk about something called the GSMA's Remote SIM Provisioning Program, and then I'm going to talk about payment and security. Um, so I'll talk about those three things. Okay, let's move forward. My slides have been watered down, but basically some of my topics include, wow, that's really huge. Okay, so as I say, it's a low-hanging fruit, number one. It'll be seen on other devices, consumer devices, also, embedded SIM is going into industrial and connected cars. So it's already in connected cars, and it's also in industrial applications. Those uh, back wheel locking uh, for the Mobike and Ofo, they use a 2G embedded SIM. Um, the GSMA's Remote SIM Provision Program, uh, NFC, which doesn't mean no functional clue, or not for commerce, it means near field communications. It's used, NFC is on most of the smartwatches. NFC will be used for your bad at home, for your octopus card, right? Uh, it uses actually NXP's MyFair. Um, and the perceptions are that these watches, all you have to do is make them. Well, you know what? They're not very sexy and they're not very cool. So you need to add fashion and luxury. The fruit sounding company has done that quite successfully. Okay, so basically Arm bought Simility Labs. We provide an embedded SIM operating system. So we don't actually physically make the physical SIM module, or uh, it just, uh, it's a more core, right? It's a module, it's not a card, it's not removable, it's embedded, it's surface mounted. We have the technology for the embedded SIM operating system, and the embedded SIM operating system was invented to be used for remote SIM provisioning on these mobile devices. What is remote SIM provisioning? Remote SIM provisioning allows you, the owner of the device, smartphone, smartwatch, tablet, notebook, to control the subscription, the 4G LTE subscription 
of the device that you own. You don't need to go to an operator at that point in time when you have this technology turned on. Remote SIM provisioning, remember this term, RSP, remote SIM provisioning from the GSMA. Um, so ARM provides the eSIM platform for that. In the embedded SIM is something called a subscription manager. The subscription manager has two parts. Um, data provisioning and secure routing of this eSIM, which is part of the RSP, remote SIM provisioning. I know this is the first time you've ever heard of this, right? You've never heard about this stuff, right? I'm telling you it's coming. ARM has the eSIM operating system now. They have the platform and they have the service, the management services for this technology. Uh, and it's going into all kinds of applications. Wearables is the low-hanging fruit. You see it first on wearables. Now, I want to talk about payment and security because that was my expertise when I worked for Jamalto a number of years ago. Uh, and usually, uh, I like to talk about the key point, which is tamper-resistant security. You need tamper-resistant security on these smartwatches. How do you get tamper-resistant security? How do you get security? How do you get an eSIM operating system into a mobile device? There are a few ways. The first is with an, uh, which is another connectivity chip, an NFC controller chip. They have a plug-in for the eSIM right now. NXP has such a solution, mostly for payment, but they have a plug-in for the eSIM. And all of these have what we call a secure element. The secure element provides the security, the tamper-resistant security uh, in devices. The second thing is, I promoted something called the TEE. In Chinese, it's Cushing, Zhixing Huanjing. That's the trusted execution environment. That is simply a security operating system that gets ported into the mobile apps processor chip and a firewall environment from ARM called Trust Zone. You, some of you people are using it now and you don't even know it, actually. Um, and that technology is now very prevalent for some of these MVNOs and some other companies that are providing a soft SIM. Soft SIM has its place in the world, especially in China, even though mobile network operators will say, hell, until hell freezes over, while well, I use soft SIM. But actually, in China, China Unicom has uh, basically kind of said, soft SIM, it's not a bad thing. So some operators, just some operators, especially in, uh, in Asia, are looking at soft SIM. The third here is basically, this remote SIM provisioning program and this eSIM operating system actually comes in two different form factors. One is the nano or the micro SIM, which was removable before. That you were actually taking the SIM you bought from the operator and putting it into your car to get 4G connectivity in their car. It just seems like very strange. I put it in my phone, now I have to put it in my car. They've done away with that with the next solution here, which is the eSIM or the EUICC. E-SIM a, is a term used by Apple aficionados. EUIC is the actual term. It's an, uh, it's an embedded universal integrated circuit card. That's what it is. Um, it's an operating system. And the, the final solution is basically, well, an E-SIM is still a, mo a SIM module. It costs money. So therefore, the ultimate solution is taking the technology and putting it someplace in the MCU for the best, highest level tamper resistant security. These are the five methods um, that are being used right now to provide an eSIM operating system in a mobile device. It doesn't have to be a smartphone, it can be anything. Let me move on. So this is the remote SIM provisioning program. Have any, let me ask you a question. Now you have to really wake up now because I'll come right into the audience and ask any one of you. Who has heard of the remote SIM provisioning program? Raise your hand. Oh my goodness. Come on. Nobody's heard of this before? You're in the headlights? Okay, I get it. All right. So basically, we're on phase two right now. I think I need to come to Hong Kong more often. Okay. So you see that there's a rise, rising percentage for wearables in China for retail payment. I've seen it. You've seen it. You even see it in Hong Kong, too. I'm cool. I have my Apple iWatch, and I do mobile payment at Starbucks. How cool is that? It is kind of cool, isn't it? But you can see very commonly that people will use wearables, NFC-enabled rings, wristbands, and watches to do payment. Why? Because all you health and fitness people, great job with your applications. I love it. Fantastic. 
but you're missing the key point. In Asia, people will not buy a smartwatch or a wristband just for health and fitness. They want the payment. They want the payment aspect because I'll guarantee you right now, almost everybody in this room has this. Am I right? What is this? This is a mobile payment solution. That's what it is. Payment in the subway. Okay. Nobody, no complaints? Okay, good. All right, let me move on. The types of people that will buy a smartwatch, in my humble opinion, are two types. The health and the sports aficionado, the, the sports enthusiast, will buy a smartwatch because they need it for the health aspect of it. But they also want to talk or receive a call during exercise or during some activity, and they don't want to put the smartphone on their body or attach it to their to their to their um, arm because it's just too heavy. The other types are the business people. Business people are so busy. If you take a smartphone out, go through the border with Shenzhen, you're gonna drop it, you're gonna lose it, you're gonna break it. It's a fact, you will. Um, and going through a subway, going through an airport, come on. You don't wanna take the watch out, you don't wanna take the phone out. You wanna take the, have the watch on the wrist. And by the way, the watch doesn't have to just reside on the wrist. I usually put it on my belt loop. I don't like to wear it on my wrist. It should be transformable to a lanyard and a medallion on the neck. It should. It will. It'll morph. Um, here, basically, we're saying that uh, lots of people are confused with how to wear and how to use a smartwatch. They really are. They don't know half the functions and features of a smartwatch. That's why I asked the question from the uh, about the biometrics and the authentication on the wrist for Apple. Um, now, um, the killer app for wearable smartwatches in China is mobile payment. I'm sorry, you uh, sports aficionados. It's not health and fitness, it's payment. Uh, I'll dispute that and I'll debate that with you 24 seven if you want. Um, there are uh, MVNOs in China, Red Team Mobile, Hong Cha Yidong, and also, what is it, Guomi, um, uh, Roam to Free. These companies, these are MVNOs that are using wearables to, uh, for payment um, and the embedded SIM technology. Um, there's lots of wearables and also, you married women with kids, you absolutely are concerned about your child, so you will want the child to have a smartwatch, but limitation on calling. You don't want them to be using payment to make all kinds of payments, or to be calling the, the Queen of England. You don't want that. You want to limit their use of the, of the, of the connectivity for, for, G, uh, for a child. You want to be able to dial to them, they want to be able to dial to you. Um, pretty much you want to limit that. But children's watches are growing in the United States and are really big in China. Um, you can see here that mobile payments, it's fueled by increased market demand. Basically in China, there's a company called Shenzhen Xuechou, Shenzhen Snowball Technology that is invested by NXP that has, right now, a mobile payment platform for smartphones and wearables that you can use, you can download it onto this watch, right there, right now, and you can do payment in the subway. Did you guys, did, did, did you know this? Did you know, did, yes, you, right there, you. Did you know that? You didn't, yeah, from China, how come you didn't know that? Okay, well, don't worry about it, we'll talk later. Uh, as I said, it's just, it's not just the watches, it's, it's uh, wristbands and it's NFC rings. Uh, and this is a little bit about this company, um, which is quite interesting because <laughs> there aren't many places in the world where you can see payment on the wrist. The smartwatch is nothing but a smartphone on the wrist. Uh, hello, newsflash. The smartphone is nothing but a smartwatch. A smartwatch is nothing but a smartphone on the wrist. That's what it is. It, does, it has all the functionality. It's just miniaturized. Um, basically, there are two mainstream apps which have emerged. Does anybody know the most important mobile app in China? Come on now. Come on now. What is it? What is it? Bingo. And some might say, no, it's not WeChat. It's, it's Jerkubao, right? It's Alipay. I guarantee you, both of those are very important to the Chinese government, to the foreign, to the ministry, of finance to the whole banking industry inside China because those two apps do payment. And payment is a critical, 
critical need, uh, and also the security of those payments are, are very important in China. But you know, mobile transit is really, really big in China. Uh, people in China use their, their, this is called a value-added transit card. This is what we call a value-added transit card. It's using MyFair, NXP's MyFair profile, and NFC uh, protocol. Uh, and it's all over the world. It's not just in Hong Kong, by the way. It's all over the world. And the key point here is that China is the largest smart watch market on the planet. Of course, the largest smartphone market on the planet. And it's also the largest transportation sector in the world. This is the largest, okay? Okay, well, all those three things make sense. Payment, transportation, security. Um, successful criteria for Chinese transit system, it's, again, as I say, it's all in place. It's all in place. Seamless, it's easy. It's over the air. It's over the air. You can do all this stuff over there. You can download the app onto your smartphone or your watch, and bingo, you can do mobile payments. Uh, that's it. Less controversy, less jokes, I'm sorry. Uh, but I, I love to take questions. So if you don't ask, I will come into the audience and pick you out. So time to ask questions. Uh, and, and trust me, I'll Mr. do that. Mr. Weaver, we would love to ask you many questions. Oh, my goodness. But we would like to do it at the evening networking. Oh, because, but I might not. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry because we're really running behind. Ah, I see. I apologize. Well, so, okay, one of, the, one, of the, I get it. one of the final thing, I have about about 130 videos on YouTube and about 60 on Youku, about 10 or 12 on smartwatches in China. So anybody who doesn't get a chance to listen to my terrible jokes, uh, if you don't see me after today, you can go on to YouTube, because you're in, uh, in Hong Kong, or you can go on Youku if, if you're in China and see much of my Chuan uh, Dai, Zhenong Shou Biao, the Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Weaver. Thank you very much. And now we are going to the last session of the day, the Startup Elevator pitch. Please welcome Payan Lam, COO of Partai Stan, who will speak about designing sport-specific wearables 